Hi there. So getting senior HEA fellowship was pretty good. Um, I don't feel that getting HEA fellowship or senior fellowship makes you a better person or better lecturer. There are really excellent people out there who don't have this. But what it is great for is certifying that you can work at that level, which is always really good. And going through the process of writing the logbook forced me to think a lot about the way I'm teaching, why I'm teaching it, and also give me permission to go and look at the textbooks and journal papers about teaching, the pedagogy, and say, you know what, I can look at this stuff and I can learn from it. Um, the whole logbook is very reflective and it gave me permission to not be perfect. I could make mistakes and then I could become better later on. So I'm going to look at some of the things that helped me get my HA fellowship and just kind of things I found useful in the process. So for this, I'm going to start with um, this, which is the mapping exercise. So for the HA Senior Fellowship, you've got to show competence in UKPSF, which is these th three categories. Um, without getting into what they are, there's things that there's things you're doing, activity, and core knowledge, which is about you just being a very knowledgeable teacher, and then professional values of you being a very responsible person. You can see what I did is I've got the three case studies on the left and very early on I mapped out which parts of the area's activities related to which case study. I could have done this a lot more. I could have had like A4, could have been in probably all three sections, but I didn't need to do that. All I needed to do was hit the target once and that's it. So I felt that target A5 was the strongest in case study one. K3 was also stronger in case study one, case study two. And that made everything very simple and straightforward. You'll also see that the, um, the layout is roughly even. So you see three points are hit in case study one, um, four points in case study two, and four points in case study three. So it kind of feels like um, spread myself out quite nicely. You'll also see that not everything is in the case studies there's four points which are only in the HEA map, which was the next document I'm going to look at. So the HEA map um, is just giving extra details. It does go over everything else as well. You've got to do that, but it just means I've not put evidence on those ones through the case studies, and that's fine. So, and that is an equal amount. It's about four. So rather than trying to cram everything into one case study or cram everything into the HA map and hoping the case studies just see me through, it's got a very nice even flow. And that was just quite a good layout, really. So that's one thing that helped me a lot. I didn't get it right the first time. I think I made it and then changed it later on when I was writing. So there we are. The other thing about this map, apart from just getting my mind in, is that when I finished my logbook, I put the page number next to um, the activity. So if someone wants to go, oh, where have you shown um, areas activity A3? Oh, that's page 23. It's very, very easy to follow. So the next thing to look at is the mapping exercise. So this is where you kind of just tell everyone why you meet the criteria. Again, I put the visual in there. Really nice introduction. Um, the start doesn't just gives you a key, doesn't really give you very much. Um, and you'll see that it's a very short paragraph for each piece. So we'll see that area A1 is in case study three, and then you're describing it. And you're really, when you understand what the area activity is, so what is the point of A1 for senior fellow? Then you go, well, yeah, but this is what we're trying to achieve. How have I met that? So everyone will be writing it different. My writing style won't be the same as yours. This was just useful. And then the page number to go. Um, as we go through, I know that the bottom parts around here. Um, yeah, you'll see that some pieces are throughout the portfolio. So there are these bits here about successfully incorporating subject and pedagogic research and scholarship. That's something I did everywhere. So it belongs in these three. Here are the parts you should really look at. 
um, there's some other bits here which I don't relate to quesos per se. These are the descriptors. Um, yeah, so V3, which is using evidence informed approaches and the outcomes from research, scholarship, and continuing professional development. That doesn't exist in the case studies, but I give a decent paragraph that really describes it well. So um, that overcame it. So just saying, well, what have I done? Um, and treat that almost that paragraph almost like a micro case study. Um, I don't think the way I wrote this was particularly good. My writing's improved a lot since then. Um, I think if I do it differently, I'd be a lot more. Um, here's the problem. Here's what we're trying to achieve. Here's what I did. Here's the outcome. A bit more formulaic, but um, references. I've got four references throughout here somewhere. I don't know where they are in this document. They're somewhere in here. Um, I must have somewhere talked about this reference being, oh, here we are, um, based on the work of Carr, uh, Middleton and Carr. So yeah, references can go in there if it's really applicable. Um, so if there's a theory which really underpins one of your case studies, then yeah, put it in. But generally, there's not really any references in here. Another thing I wish I'd done differently with this, I now use Grammarly for writing. I wish I had Grammarly back then um, and caught all of the terrible spelling. But it's okay because it's not a, it's not a professional writing exercise. You're not trying to get perfect grammar. As long as it's written okay, that's fine. So you can see it's about eight pages long, including that so front page and pieces. So let's say about six pages of mapping. It took me really about a day to write this. It wasn't particularly long. Um, it was more kind of trying to remember what I'd done over the last few years. That was the biggest task. So then we got onto the portfolio, the final piece. This is the most important part because your mapping, you can look over as a reviewer and go, yeah, you've done that. You've, you've touched all the areas. Now let's see if you've really done it. So uh, front page, completely irrelevant. Doesn't actually matter. March 2018. Quick career journey. Apparently it's quite useful to like show your progression. Did you just sit around doing nothing or have you actually done something? It just fleshes out who you are. Um, it's quite short. Again, the map. Um, this is an earlier version which doesn't have the page numbers on. Uh, in hindsight, I wish I'd replaced that with the one with the page numbers, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and again, you're talking about the HA descriptor 3. And that's um, for... Uh, for senior fellow at Scripter 3, for regular fellow at Scripter 2. So that's cited in there using Mendeley. So I'm just sort of saying, well, where in my portfolio have I done this? So you see that Scripters 1 to 3 are all covered in Figure 1 because they're talking about um, UKPSA, it's like the activity, core knowledge, professional values. And if you look at this figure, you'll see, yeah, I've, I've done them all. And here's all the parts to talk about. So that's all split up. Then we get on to areas five to six. And I would have been very nebulous saying, hey, it's in sections 2.2 to four, which is basically the whole portfolio. I could have done that better. I could have um, really specified where I do this. And that probably would have been a good move. But it was fine because it just shows that this document talks about this a lot. And the coordination, supervision and management. This one, part seven, is what sets regular HEA apart from senior HEA. So a regular HEA fellow um, will have all of the parts one to six and be really good. A senior will be someone who coordinates, supports, and supervises students. Um, that can be quite vague. Um, we tend to think of supervision as being a line manager or a boss. The HEA takes a wider interpretation. So I got mine because I was running a student support scheme for three years, I think it was, three or four years, where every year I had 12 students join my team. I would be mentoring them and developing their leadership abilities. They would be going and mentoring the other students and working with the students. When there were problems that had come to me, we'd have debrief sessions and they would gain skills through that. So even though at the time of applying this, I hadn't even passed my first probation on being a lecturer. 
I qualified as being a senior fellow because I'd done that level of coordination as well as everything else. Um, every institute will have different schemes. I know that Loughborough doesn't give people that level of responsibility so early. So someone at Loughborough wouldn't get that far, not because they can't, just because the structure of the admin doesn't set up that way. So that's what the senior one is. And that's really what you're looking for to be excellent above the rest. You wouldn't do well in the whole thing, but you really want level seven to be excellent because that makes you a senior. So talk about the students I've been working on. Um, in my case, it was about 350 students a year working on um, courses, the gender breakdowns, things. This is like the old CV part, just fleshing out who we're talking about um, so we understand what's happening. Then we've got the case studies. Now, the case studies I did very formulaic. There's no one way to do it, and everyone's portfolio will be different. So the, here's the formula I used. I started off with a really quick summary of the key parts. And this is, if you remember, case study one has three parts of the UKPSF. And there are three bullet points there. So I was highlighting, these are the parts you want to take care of. These are the parts that you really need to sit up and take notice of to let you pass that part so that they don't have to read the whole thing before knowing that you've done it. So that really helps. Um, if I was making this again, I'd probably label these as which party KPSF it was. Um, that was useful. Anyway, quick introduction there. Uh, QR code, that takes you over to a video I made about the scheme. This is my mentoring one. Um, just kind of fleshing out, again, it gives you the opportunity to tell more of a story. I don't know if anyone ever scanned that QR code, but it was there. And I quite liked the fact that I could put those extra bits in. So I talked about what's the context of what I'm doing. So what is this task? You know, why were you given it? Why were you doing it? And maybe what were you trying to achieve? Was there a sort of goal or a problem that you had to solve? Um, you know, when I took over the PAR scheme, it was failing. You know, students didn't take it. N no one cared about it. It was really dead. So I had to make a new strategy to revive the, the scene. So if you can, you know, it, the classic way of writing stories, introduce the character. So who the people are, who the scheme is, what you're trying to do, and then throw what the problem is that you've got to try and solve. Because then we've got a nice setup. Uh, the next section was theory. So what theory involves. That is really critical. You've got to have the theory informing what you're doing. And you see that as you go through here, I've got um, one, two pedagogical, three pedagogical references, um, one uh, reference to learning outcomes from the university, and um, talking about the HA descriptors. You know, what was it about HA descriptors that were useful in doing this? So, you know, this is, these are the ideas that really helped me do what I was doing. And I said, this kind of stuff's really good for just enriching your ability to um, just read, be a better lecturer. Um, and during this, you're saying, well, what did you do? So here's a theory. How did you use it? How did you apply it? So, um, you know, here's the theory above. Identify key elements that can influence my influence mentorship based on this Martin's um, con concepts of um, scholarship, teaching, and learning. I developed three concepts, which was engaging with knowledge, self-reflection, and public sharing. So during the debriefs, I did that stuff. Anyway, now we're going to detail of actually what what did I do and what was the impact of it? Because there's no point just saying I did something. You know, anyone could do anything with good intentions, but if it doesn't work, you know, that's something you have to think about. So, you know, I talked about student engagement. Um, I ran a quick Bayesian analysis and worked out that students were like 30%, about 31% achieved a good grade when they attended my, my course. Um, and it just had, it, you know, you can look on the screen there. The Bayesian analysis really showed that students had a higher probability 
of attending, of um, achieving a high grade after attending my schemes. So that does show that the schemes were doing something, that they were working, and the students were really helping. Um, so yeah, that's really part of that. So then that's just the general impact. Then we go into the parts of the KPSF, so the core knowledge, the professional values, and various pieces. These are those three bits identified before. And you're talking about, um, you know, what does it address? How did I do this? Um, I haven't read this in a long time, so it's kind of a bit strange to read it back. Um, but yeah, what did you do? What went well? And also, what didn't go well? You know, where did you screw up a bit? And what did you learn from screwing up? What would you do in the future? Um, you know, so this is really your kind of honesty box area. Um, you know, sometimes the see here, sometimes the leaders felt their first training to be a leader felt them ill-equipped to lead a small teaching. Um, so to address this problem, I did that. I had further sessions. I did this, I had agile, etc. So you're really being very honest. And in some case studies I put in, I put in that it was terrible. I, I can't remember which one it was, but I did something that just did not work. You know, I had major conflict with um, one of the teaching support staff. Um, students did not take to the module because of the um, conflict. They didn't meet the learning outcomes very well. Um, and this grand plans I have just did not work. So I set out kind of, right, this is what I should have done, and this is why I should have done it. And that's fine. You don't have to be great. It's okay to admit your failings. I think some of the best portfolios do admit your failings. And that's why portfolios can be very personal, that you don't want your colleagues to see you being so open about, you know, maybe maybe your emotions have made you feel. You, know, you could maybe write here about how you went to have a little cry about some stuff. So it carries on professional values, doing the same kind of thing. Um, what I did, what was good, what was bad, what I did later on. Um, and then you've got sort of just further fulfillment of UKPSF. Key lessons and future plans. It's carrying on. So that's my very basic formula. And if you kind of look at the other bits about YouTube, you've got context, theoretical underpinning, um, screenshots, so images, impact analysis, going down into the core values again. So it's very easy for the reader to just walk through each case and go, yeah, I can really clearly see how it all fits in. Um, I can clearly see that you're reading broadly from the literature, you're taking it in, you're applying it well, and you're working very professionally. These parts, I can see you working very strong. You're very wonderful here. These parts over there, I can see that you're going to become strong because you've got the right mindset and approach. Uh, so that's where we are. Moving through, um, lots of more bits. I don't think there's anything at the end I did. Um, references, obviously really good. Um, I use Mendeley, really pro tip. But after that, that's it really. So if you can start with your map and saying, well, this is how it fits together, then that will really help you write your portfolio and get this really clear. Um, maybe as you're working through, you'll go, no, nope, this is wrong, and you'll rejig this. Once you've got this um, portfolio and this map done, the last thing, get this um, mapping exercise completed. I found it very easy to do because I'd spent the time working on this. All in all, I think it was a very straightforward approach. Um, it was quite enjoyable in a way, um, and it was quite fast. It took me... I reckon if I sat down, I could just do the whole thing in a week. Um, probably less than a week. Um, because I was, I was already very aware of what I was doing, why I was doing it. And I've been keeping lots of notes about this. So I hope this kind of insight has been useful for you on producing your senior fellow application. Um, any questions, let me know.